here by police misconduct and um, that scene right here. Um, and in the United States, there is actually an additional piece of legislation that was ratified by the Convention Against Torture in 1994, which protects citizens' rights against torture in general. So we wanted to give you a definition um, so you better understood what we were talking about specifically. All right, um, so when I was looking um, at comparing the US and the UK, uh, some of the causes that I found um, didn't really change based on location, um, and that included like individual biases, discrimination, racism, things like that, because those type of things depend on the individual. Um, there might be a higher concentration in some places, but overall that's really going to, to, going to depend on the person, not so much on the location. Um, some causes, however, can change uh, based on location, and one of the major ones is pressure. Um, like Connor Brandon have said, um, the read method is used in the US and that plays a big role because going into an interrogation, the goal of the officer is kind of to get a confession, get a conviction, um, not worry about what happened, but try to kind of play the blame game. Whereas in the UK, they're more focused on finding out what happened in the case and not so much about finding out, you know, like, uh, the blame and the um, so, two major cases. Uh, in the U.S., the John Birch case involving 101 known victims of torture set the precedence for police misconduct in the states. And all of the victims, or majority, were located in Area 2 and 3 of Chicago, which are highly segregated and criminalized areas of the South Side. Um, so, many of Birch's victims then were racial minorities, which only perpetuated sort of my stance on um, the institutional racism that you see throughout the Chicago police misconduct. Um, in response, there were several measures taken uh, to reduce the systematic issues. Um, likewise, in the UK, the Stephen Lawrence case became the catalyst for much of the precautionary measures against institutional racism and issues of police misconduct. So you've heard a bit about PACE, um, which is the Police and Criminal Act of 1984, and that ensures the protection of individuals from police misconduct, improper investigation procedures, and improper collection of evidence. Um, the act protects the police um, as well as the subject suspects and the general public by making it um, sort of something to check back to. Um, it's a, a reference point, and by making it uh, available online, uh, the general public is able to know their rights uh, as well. Um, the Equality Act of 2010 uh, protects individual rights as well, and that also helps to inform individuals in the UK about their rights so that they know um, sort of the precautionary measures that have been taken against police misconduct. Um, in Chicago, the IPRA, which is the Independent Police Review Authority, um, acts as the intake for police misconduct records, and these complaints are divided into categories, such as sustained, unsustained, unfounded, and exonerated, and all these claims are then investigated. Um, I think that this seems to be a good step in the right direction for creating a healthy relationship between the police and the general public. Um, because it holds the police a bit more accountable for what they're doing with a review process in place, uh, which is great, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so um, I basically, uh, after I compared the two, I basically decided that I think the UK has more opportunity to prevent misconduct from happening. And there are a few reasons that I came to this conclusion. One of the main ones is the fact that in the UK they have mandatory recording of interrogations. Um, We've heard, you know, before uh, there are obvious reasons why this is good because, um, you know, you're cutting down on discrepancies. You know, you're you're able to check what was said versus what's being reported and things like that. Um, there's also the goals of the interrogation, which, um, again, I kind of mentioned earlier, just the fact of going in and trying to decide, you know, for for an interrogation whether you're trying to get a um, a conviction or find out what actually happened. And then there's also the training and the methods. Um, in the U.S., officers are trained with methods that um, can use coercive language, suggestive wording, um, things like that. And I think that by not bringing up, bringing up, you know, facts about the case or using that kind of wording, you can cut down on wrongdoing and things like that as well. 
Um, so I don't think that the U.S. Sh can or should totally adapt the U.K. system, but there are certain parts that should be. Um, obviously, um, recording of interrogations. I think that there should be just like a national law requiring manda mandatory recording because right now there are, I believe, 14 states, the District of Columbia, and then just a bunch of individual um, police stations around the U.S. that are um, recording interrogations, but there's a lot of discrepancy involved. Um, like Brandon said, in Illinois, it's just video recording of murder cases and that's it. Um, some places have audio recording for all interrogations. Some are just video recording for some. So there's a lot of inconsistency in the um, type of recording of interrogations. And then there's the fact that, you know, just some places don't have any recording at all. Um, I also think there needs to be a change in the mindset of the police organization as a whole. Um, like I said before, they need to be less focused on confession and conviction and just more focused on finding out what happened. And then um, they also need to change the interrogation methods um, to not be as coercive or anything like that as well. Okay. Um, so uh, we both agreed, however, that both systems need to change how um, they deal with misconduct because right now there's not much that happens if um, wrongdoing is, you know, discovered by police officers. Um, and I think that um, with the fact that there's no accountability, um, by having consequences um, and knowing that the police won't just turn a blind eye, whether it's, you know, um, having leadership training or criminal charges or things like that for the police officers, um, it, it kind of cuts back on wrongdoing and misconduct because when officers know that there's consequences involved, they will hopefully not do it as much. Um, so the areas where I felt um, we could make some improvements would be on the IPRA side. Um, I did not know anything about the IPRA. So if I wanted to file a complaint, um, I would have known my resource. And I wouldn't, and if I didn't have the resources that I have as a privileged individual, um, I would not be able to file a complaint. I would not be able to stand up for my rights. And so I think having this information be a lot more available would be the first step. Um, the second thing would be due process. So whether that be like a judicial matrix where um, for certain numbers of offenses or certain numbers of complaints, um, police officers have a certain type of review. And I haven't found anything that really systematically shows what that is. Um, I think that these changes are really imperative to holding police accountable and serving justice. Um, and you can see that through the John Burge case. I mean, he received a very small sentence and the other officers who were involved um, were simply reprimanded or not even reprimanded at all. And I think that that sort of um, culture that we have in Chicago um, sort of sets the standard and that's really unfortunate.
Find Me For Hill, and I'm Eleanor Peck, and we are doing our presentation on DNA forensics and eyewitness testimony. Can you space <laughs> um, So I'm going to be looking at DNA, and I'll be looking at the factors, um, the lack of unifying international standards in DNA testing, uh, lack of error rate testing in the actual forensics labs, and absolute versus probabilistic conclusions made in the court. Uh, I focused on eyewitness memory and how it's a lot more fallible than we really believe, and it's not common knowledge that it is fallible, so that's a problem in the court. Then. And these factors all lead to jurors misunderstanding the trial, which can lead to wrongful convictions. So DNA got its start in the UK, and uh, currently the common um, uh, the common way of measuring DNA uh, is to use the STR or short tandem repeat method, which produces um, a lot, of, which um, you can use to compare with uh, two samples. So uh, there are literally like 13 specific locations that the US uses. There are 10 that the UK uses, so not an international standard um, that you compare with uh, two samples um, to state whether or not they match um, and they come from the same source. Uh, but the problem is that there is no error rate testing, so there's no way of knowing how often um, these scientists are getting things wrong necessarily. There has been some done, but it was not double blind study, and uh, it cannot be extrapolated onto the whole of forensic studies in general. Um, and then once in the courtroom, these results are being played off as a 100% match, which goes against the scientific method, because uh, in scientific method, you have to produce a probabilistic, so like a percentage match. So you would say that there's like a 99% chance that this uh, sample comes from the same source that this sample does, uh, instead of betraying the uniqueness fallacy, where you'd have to test every single individual to actually 100% prove that they come from the same source. Uh, so, but DNA can still be used um, for DNA um, exonerations, and the U.S. has been very uh, good with this. There have been over 200 DNA exonerations. Uh, however, it's very important, even then, to be very responsible with the use of DNA. Of those 200 plus DNA exonerations, 75% um, of them were based on eyewitness memory. So there's um, eyewitness testimony. Um, so there's a real issue with eyewitness testimony and that it is fallible and it's not as um, it's not as correct as everyone believes. There, um, there was a study done of expert witnesses, mainly psychologists, who, um, who measured their amounts of, um, of different factors that they think led to um, eyewitness, eyewitnesses being wrong. And when, when other people were polled, like jurors and judges and um, lawyers, they all had completely different answers than the psychologists did. So there really is a misunderstanding about what is, um, what is correct with eyewitness memory and what is real and what is not real that we have to rectify. So during our research in London, I uh, came to the understanding that DNA exonerations are not pushed as heavily uh, in the UK in general. And I believe this is because of the inquisitorial system, which you've heard about, um, versus the adversarial system, which we use uh, and I think that the adversarial system sort of breeds a culture of fighting for one's own side, maybe in the face of an opponent or adversity, which might make innocence projects or other such organizations to fight wrongful conviction and more likely to spring up. So there is more of a hesitancy towards using DNA, which could be good in the sense that it is not overly used or misrepresented as much. However, the UK might be